who's this guy that got the the pole through his through his skull and it and it and it totally oh. it changed his behavioral traits? Phineas, Phineas Gage, Phineas Gage. Every neuroscientist, while they're still in the crib, is forced to hear the story of Phineas Gage because it's <laughs> it's like it's. It's ground zero for neuroscientists having something useful to say about free will. 1840s, Phineas Gage was working on a railroad construction line. Somebody screwed up something with some dynamite and did what they weren't supposed to do. And it blew a three foot long, 13 pound metal rod when it exploded into Gage's eye and out the top of his head his forehead and in the process landing 13 feet over from there in the process it also took out his frontal cortex which was like nicely splattered all over the the acreage there so gage just had it went, all, it went all the way through and came out came out the other side yes yes and if you ever find <laughs> yourself at uh harvard's medical school and go into their library they have have Phineas Gage's skull is on display there. Huh. And you could see the entry point and the exit point and the pole that's on display there also. Um, so Whoa. Gage gets up, which is amazing in and of itself. This thing went through at sufficiently high speed that it cauterized every blood vessel. And like, wow, he stands there and he and some of his construction crew compatriots go into town where a doctor looks and you know looks in the empty space there and diagnoses things saying you you have a hole in your brain there and as epically described as gage was no longer gage he had a massive transformation in his personality he was the foreman of this railroad of this railroad construction crew he was this sober god-fearing church attending sobrietist reliable self-disciplined guy and overnight literally overnight he was turned into this foul mouth profane disinhibited guy who wasn't able to work for years and years afterward <clears throat> Gage was no longer Gage. Um, and this was the first very unsubtle example that mis material stuff inside your head is essential to what makes us us. And, you know, Gage is a simple case. Wow, here's Gage who, like, two years later is cursing loudly in church, blaspheming, all of that. Why did he do that? It's easy to see because there was a metal rod's worth of explanation because of that accident that happened to him. That's why that one's easy for us to look at and say, oh, you know, he had no control over that, that this part of the brain is, it was damaged. Where we really have trouble is not when it is something as much of a sledgehammer as a metal rod, but having to deal with the fact that who each of us are, why did each of us just do what we did sitting there in church or in any such, why? Because of a million, zillion, gazillion microsco microscopic little threads from the past that sculpted us into who we are. And the thing is, it's easy to see the single sledgehammer that made Gage Gage and it's so much harder for us to accept that you put all those zillion microscopic threads of your past together, and it is going to be as powerful as a, as a metal rod blasting through your head. It's just harder to see distributed causality. A lot of it, we don't even know about yet how it works. A lot of it is just probabilistic, a lot of, but put all those threads together and there's nothing but the conclusion that you are nothing more than everything that came before that turned you into the sort of person that you are right now. And sometimes it's easy to see how that happened. A metal rod, childhood poverty, trauma, whatever, being raised in enormous privilege. And sometimes it's these little threads going back to like your hunter-gatherer ancestors inventing their culture versus your agriculturalist ancestors and everything in between. When we spoke about the, the, the gauge example, with the pole through his head and he shows up and, and suddenly he is a, quite a nasty person by by all accounts i think people would intuitively look at him and say well okay yeah he's he's turned into you know a bit of a jerk but it's not his fault 
there, there's kind of a sense in which you might feel sorry for him because even though, yeah, he might say profane things about the God that you believe in now and that he seemingly believed in at least yesterday, <laughs> uh, look, you know, he had a pole through his head, so let him off. Now, if you're right that all human behavior is a result of a similarly uh, uh, sort of a, a process that's similar in the sense that you don't have control over it, then this leads to quite a radical conclusion that we should probably adopt the same approach to essentially anybody doing anything any of the time. Is, is that your position? Um, exactly. That's the only logical extension. It's the only intellectually honest and ethically honest conclusion to reach, which is this completely nutty stance that blame and punishment as virtues in and of themselves, rather than as instrumental tools, blame and punishment never make any sense whatsoever in any realm of human life. And holding a mirror up to that, likewise, praise and reward never make any sense whatsoever because it is that's the circumstance in which some people are treated better than average for reasons they had nothing to do with, as opposed to the world of people being treated worse than average for reasons they blame, punishment, reward, praise, a sense of entitlement, a sense that you have earned anything, a sense that hating a person is ever justified. None of those make any sense whatsoever. And in principle, you need to run the world without any of that stuff, which uh, ain't a trivial task to take on.